and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. In recent years, there's been a surge in drought-tough plants like agaves, yuccas, and cacti. Now destructive insects are surging upon them. Today, entomologist Wizzy Brown identifies a few of the culprits and explains what we can do. On tour, let's visit a succulent design where beauty outnumbers the problems. Even in drought, and in deer country, Jeff Pavlot spends more time collecting plants and dividing them for friends than caring for them. Sure, like any plants, his cacti and succulents need some maintenance, along with gardener sensibility to their favored setting. And they get moved around when Jeff has a new idea for them or that spot. But most of the time, they simply grace the hillside that used to wash onto the driveway in a rainstorm. It all started when he and partner Ray Clayton tackled a problematic slope near the house. It was kind of a learn-as-you-go thing. We both were learning how to use mortar and work with stone. Built a pond, and after a while doing that, then we decided to get more adventurous and start working on all of the walls in the rest of the garden. And there really wasn't an overall vision initially on what it was going to be. There was just a few walls that we needed to keep soil from rolling down. And it sort of expanded and expanded and expanded into what uh, you see today. There was sort of this hole where the pond is now, and I tried to landscape it with stuff that was a little bit shady, uh, but looking at it, it was like it just seemed like the perfect place to put a water feature. It's a little bit different in that it's mostly above ground. You just can't really tell it, uh, but we built that in there and um, thought it was a great addition. We moved on to starting with the rest of the garden, uh, just to fix this, this hillside kept rolling down into our driveway. So we started building the retaining walls and then I started getting more and more into the plants and landscaping. I've really liked the uh, agaves and aloes and cactus and things for a long time, I wasn't, I mean, I had a few little potted plants here and there and I would sit them around, um, you know, for years. Uh, but then when I started landscaping here, first of all, the deer will eat almost everything. And this, that's an area where I could plant most anything I wanted and I don't have to worry about the deer eating them. Also, I don't have to water the garden and that's a big plus. The more I work with the plants, the more I found that I've enjoyed them. Now on the cacti and stuff, I like the look of the spines. I don't like the feel of them so much gardening around them, but uh, they are, uh, I think, really attractive. It gives you a lot of uh, real strong shapes to work with. But like with any plants, styling them produces harmonious design. Because they have strong shapes, you have to be careful not to put too many of the same shapes in uh, even patterns. Uh, odd, and odd groupings of things uh, tend to work the best and uh, trying to just get a balance and mix of different colors and usually I try to throw in other textures. One thing when I am, when I do get a new batch of plants in, I move them around and leave them in, first in their pots, kind of try to see what looks the best and I spend a fair bit of time before I actually start digging and putting them in. But uh, a big advantage of cacti and succulents are you can move them around as long as you can physically dig it up and move it. You, it doesn't matter how big it is. Uh, they don't mind. They, they can sit for days um, out of soil. Uh, they ship easily. So um, if you want to move it from one end of the garden and then wait until you get a bed ready on the other end, you can do that. So it's easy to kind of work it around. It's not like if you dig it up, it's going to just keel over and die. And the more I got into the plants, finding out what I could grow in the ground, um, I'm just naturally a, a collector of things. So started collecting all the different types I could find and then of course then I started moving into the things that I couldn't grow without a greenhouse and uh, I had everything across in front of the pond I had about 300 plants at one time just all different things that weren't cold hardy that I'd pull in and out in the winter and then I got caught one day when it froze before I got home I found out what would freeze and what wouldn't but uh, after that I was like I definitely need the greenhouse so once I got the greenhouse that sort of opened up it's like I had to fill it For some that are semi-hardy, he just builds a mini greenhouse around them. 
at the top of the property, Jeff and Ray hauled more stones to build a staircase and upper story patio. Following the hillside's terrain, they connected it to the lower levels. I really like millstone fountains, and so that was something I wanted to incorporate into another garden area. And the other thing I was wanting to build was a place to put my aloes. So when I got to designing that area, that's one of the last areas along the front uh, to do. Uh, by that point, I had done enough rock work and stuff that I knew pretty well what I was doing. I really do like Japanese gardens and that sort of uh, Zen design, and it, although it's not in any way adhering to any strict uh, Japanese principles. It's, you know, sort of, I think it gets that feel a little bit with the gravel. And then, you know, I wanted to have the bubbling millstone. And I just, uh, it just sort of evolved that way. I, I did a lot of uh, drawings for that area before I actually started building. Um, the general shape of the area was dictated by the way the cliff runs along the front of the property. And, um, you know, then I just went from there. With cardboard concrete tubing, he made inexpensive pedestals for his container plants. Their last project, at least until the next inspiration hits, are the steps he and Ray built to connect a cactus garden near the greenhouse to the play area they built for their son, Clayton. He helped too. When our son was born, um, he would sit in his little stroller out when we finished the last section where the aloes are planted. And uh, uh, he had a lot of fun when he was a little out, you know, helping out too. Before he was six, Clayton had become a plant collector himself. He has his own uh, shelf in my greenhouse and he'll go to the show and sale and he'll pick out plants he wants to buy. I've heard a lot of people that worry about these plants with small children. Uh, you know, my son was born with all of these plants and their children are pretty careful. Um, it's older people that have to generally watch out. I do snip the tips off of the really sharp agaves and things that are eye level, both for me now and also, you know, for him, because I don't want any serious injury like that. But uh, in general, you just keep your hands out of them and, you know, it's fine. For our club, one of the big uh, selling points is the fact that the plants are so easy to grow. Um, for most people um, that say that they can't grow plants, one of the issues is water. And I myself have this problem. I can kill a fern so fast. But uh, on a plant that needs water once a week, once every three weeks, you know, it's really easy to take care of. I mean, it's fairly low maintenance. Um, and I think that's easy for a lot of people. It's like, you know, for really active people, I'm gonna go away for a week. You know, I don't have to have anyone come water my plants. Um, and I mean, I think they're very, you know, they're very exotic also in a lot of ways. Thanks for sharing your garden with us, Jeff. And for our audience out there, you can meet Jeff and other members of the Austin Cactus and Succulent Society at their Labor Day show and sale on September 3rd and 4th at the Zilker Botanical Garden. Find out more at austincss.com. I'm now joined by Wizzy Brown from Texas AgriLife Extension Service. And uh, for those who love all the plants that we just saw, our topic is a sad one today. That is true. And we're talking about a lot of critters that have kind of invaded our area or have blossomed in terms of their populations because so many of us are turning to the kinds of plants that Jeff gardens with. Right. Um, uh, you know, I love agaves, uh, but agaves, yuccas, hesperalos, all these beautiful plants that do so well in our hot weather. Mm -hmm. Um, all have pests that seem to be particularly attracted to them. Yes, yes they do. And 
they they can be a real problem. I mm -hmm. mean, usually people buy those plants because they are so low maintenance, and when these pop up, they're kind of shocked because then they actually have to do something with them other right. than water maybe once a month. Right, right. And, you know, a lot of us are you know, are distraught about this because um, in, in, in the case of some of these insects, there's literally nothing you can do. Right, um, and it can be devastating. It, it's very devastating to a gardener who, for example, in my former garden, I had, you know, about 30 different species of agaves, lost over a third of them in about a year's time to the agave snout weevil, which we'll mm -hmm. be talking about. Nothing that could really be done about that. Is there a reason why we're seeing this blossoming uh, of these insect populations? Are they just following our habits? I, I think that they are following our habits. More people are turning to these plants as kind of architectural pieces in the landscape, and they are very low maintenance once they're established, so they're great plants to have. But like you said, the agave snout weevil is just a terrible pest when you do get mm -hmm. it in your yard. Well, the, the other pests aren't quite as loathsome. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on who you talk to. <laughs> are quite as loathsome as the agave snout weevil, but yeah, I guess it depends on what kind, of, what plants you have in your garden and what they're attacking. Um, but let, let's talk about the, the particular critters and you know what can and cannot be done on sure. this. Now, the agaves, as you indicated, are these beautiful, bold, sculptural plants. What are the first signs that you have a problem? Um, the first signs is just the the outer part of it or the lower part of it starts to die away. And then usually that all kind of turns to mush and then you can pull out the center stem and it's just gone. Yeah. And the collapse in this case looks like it happens in a hurry. Yes, it, it happens very quickly. I mean, it's one of those that your plant's fine and then all of a sudden it's like, wait, there's a problem. And at that point, it's really too late to do mm. anything. And when I noticed it in my garden initially, I thought it looked to me like these plants were drowning, but I never watered them. Right, yes, because it does get mushy. What happens is the female will lay her eggs at the base of the plant and they bore into the larvae, bore into the plant, and they take a bacteria with them and that starts rotting the plant as well as the insects feeding on the inside. So not only do they eat the heart out, they bring a disease along yes. with them. It's the one-two punch. <laughs> yeah, well, that's why the plants crater the way that they do. Now, um, in what, in my research, what I, uh, what I read was that the only uh, insecticide that was any of any use whatsoever was preventative, and those were systemic insecticides. That is correct. Which were highly toxic, nasty things. And they're not on the least toxic list. They are uh, more stout pesticides that are going to be around, but if you're trying to protect your plant, then that could be a good thing. But mm. you do want to do a systemic drench around the base of the plant if you're concerned about that. Yeah, and, and, the, and let me just say, these are these are not soapy water kinds of no, things. Sir. No, these are nasty. They're going to kill a lot of stuff. And so they're not selective about uh, what's going to happen there in a lot of ways. With systemic pesticides, they get taken into the plant, so right. any insect that feeds on it will get that dose. Yeah, I think the, 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 the soil around the plants, it gets dosed, doused yes, in these yes, things that probably. Yes, as well, yes. <laughs> I have a feeling that, that that's not very good to all concerned, but uh, you know I don't have the science on that. But uh, so that's the agave snout weevil, and uh, we have a lot of images of that. Now, um, one thing about the agave snout weevil and the plants is that people can do something, and that is practice good g garden hygiene, right? Yes, good garden hygiene. Uh, try not to crowd your plants, which with agaves that have offsets, mm -hmm. you know, you want to kind of dig those and remove those as much as you can. And then making sure that your plants are healthy. Don't overwater them, and that can lead to more of a problem because you're stressing those plants proper out. Proper disposal of the corpses, too. Yes, that is very important. Double bag those and throw them in the garbage. Do not throw them in the compost pile, and you want to double bag them so those bugs can't escape and go infect other things. Yeah. Okay, so that's really, really important. Now, uh, the, the invaders are not limited to the snout weevils. There's also a species called cactus bugs, which I've seen on my opuntias mm -hmm. in the past. Yes. These are tricky little very guys. very cute little bugs. I don't know. 
they, they are cute. Um, they're a small kind of grayish <laughs> bug with white stripes and they have red heads, but they are small. Mm -hmm. uh, piercing sucking mouth parts, so they cause yellowing and they can cause mm -hmm. scarring on the pads. Yeah, and the herds of them. Yes, they're and, and they hide not from just you when one. they see you coming. Yes. They'll move around to the other side. So when you try to control them, you might want to, you know, get some help to herd them your direction. Uh, but you can get rid of them with insecticidal soap. You can yeah. use botanicals. High pressure water spray a lot of times yeah. will work on them. Yeah, and I found the insect. This is one where insecticidal soap worked really well for me. It took a little while to get it under control, a couple of seasons, mm -hmm. but uh, reduced the herd considerably yes. with just the soapy water. Yes. But uh, so we have the cactus bugs, they attack the opuntias and other things. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are specialty bugs for hesperallos and, and yuccas as well? Yes, there's also yucca plant bugs. Again, this is a very small bug. It's kind of a bluish metallic color with a mm -hmm. red head. And they will, again, piercing, sucking mouth parts, so they cause yellowing and um, kind of scar tissue on the. Mm -hmm. But again, insecticidal soap will work well, yeah. high pressure water sprays. But they also tend to all go down when you're trying to control them. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of difficult to get at sometimes. So they've got us pretty well figured out, a lot of these yes. critters. The, yes. they, they know our ways. Big creature hide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big creature hide. I think that's pretty instinctive for all of us. Yes. <laughs> Something 10,000 times your size stumbles your way? Yeah, hide. Um, now, uh, cochineal is one that a lot of us who, especially who grow opuntias, are familiar with. Um, and it's kind of an interesting little critter. Yes, related to mealybug. They, they, yes, scale insects are related to mealybugs. These guys are a soft scale, so they have that fluffy white covering. Mm -hmm. But if you squish it, it releases a red dye that has actually been used in industries throughout the year as a dye mm -hmm. product. You're right. So that's the cochineal, and if you see your prick, prickly pears all covered with this cottony looking mm -hmm. stuff, that's what you're looking at. It's yes. not a disease, it's a living insect. Correct. Soapy water again. Soapy water, high pressure water sprays. Mm -hmm. If you can, if it's on just one or two pads, you can break those off, double bag them, and get rid of okay. them. Okay. And there's also a hard scale yes. that's related uh, that doesn't look like an insect, but it is. Right. And those can be in really high populations. So a lot of those, mm -hmm. uh, you'll need to use some sort of maybe a horticultural oil, but right. you want to watch that in heat. Mm -hmm. Insecticidal soap, uh, you can also use systemic products. Okay. But you want to make sure that. Um, they get taken care of. Right. Well, I, I wish we had a happier topic today, Wizzy, but these are, these are all, uh, what, you know, enemies for the garden that we can be aware of. And good, being informed is half the battle. Yes. So anyway, we, we appreciate you coming along. Thank you. And hope that the uh, viewers out there will protect all those lovely striking plants that are doing so well we think. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> right. Thanks, Woozy. Thank Coming you. up next, Daphne. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. I'm Daphne Richards and this is Augie Doggy. Our question this week is what does it mean to pinch back a plant? Well, pinching back a plant is simply pinching off the growing tips. At each of these tips is a terminal bud, which is responsible for growth of the plant in length or height. And in this terminal bud, a plant hormone that inhibits lateral growth, or growth in width, is produced. When you pinch off the terminal bud, you remove the source of that inhibitory hormone, and thus you encourage the plant to grow from its lateral buds, those that occur down the sides of the stem. That encourages the plant to grow bushier rather than taller. Pinching back is very commonly done in the nursery trade to give mums and other potted plants a nice, dense, compact look that we, as plant purchasers, find more aesthetically pleasing. Our plant this week is aloe vera. There are over 200 species of aloe, but we're most familiar with this one because of its gooey sap. It's in everything from sunburn gel to nutritional supplements. It's an easy succulent to grow. It does best when almost completely ignored, so don't overwater it or pay too much attention to it. It is sensitive to frost, so it's best in a container that you can bring in and protect. It also rots easily, so don't woe for water or use any compost in the soil around it. Use about half sand, half potting soil in your containers for this plant. It does love the heat, but it gets scorched in a full day of intense summer sun here in Texas, so it'll do fine in a little shade. It will usually be a deeper green in those lower light intensity areas as well. 
This plant does produce a lot of offsets, little plantlets that emerge at the base of the stem of your original plant. They can get pretty scraggly if left to their own devices, so it's best to divide them once those plantlets have begun to get out of control in the container. It's very forgiving of abuse. Because they're so succulent, they're sensitive to frost, so be sure to cover or bring in your containers up onto the porch to protect them. If temperatures are going to get near freezing, make sure that you do that. Our pet of the week this week is a Texas tree lizard named the Dude that hangs out with Robert Breeze. The Dude grabs a drink every morning when Robert mists his tomato plants. Yep, it's hot when lizards come to you for water, so make your own friend. To do in your garden this week, start a garden diary to note what worked this year in both the freezing and the scorching hot temperatures and what plants need to be replaced. We'd love to hear from you. Please visit klru.org ctg to send us your pet of the week or a plant or a question from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with John Drongle for Backyard Basics. Hello, gardening friends. Welcome to Backyard Basics. Another one of the many questions come in about succulents and cacti. You know, they're very popular these days. And so in dealing with them, you may want to learn about feeding them, and it doesn't take much. These guys are real slow growers. You might use a fish emulsion at maybe a quarter of its recommended uh, application. So it's a very subtle amount. Some of these guys can live in the house on the windowsill, a real bright windowsill. Others can be planted right out in the garden, and those are the kind of plants we need these days, as you can imagine. So um, they work both ways. Now, um, they're tough to transplant. When you buy them, they're in a small container. They're all prickly. And so um, you got to get them out of there without tearing them up because you lose the cosmetics of a good-looking cactus. And um, even though they look kind of rough, when they bloom, they're like orchids. They're just really gorgeous. So one of the ways that um, I can transplant them, or, and I recommend that you do this too, is uh, to grab them. But put a newspaper between you and the cactus. So one of the things to do is to fold it over and fold it over, fold it over, making a little belt. There you go. You've got a nice little belt right there. And so uh, the crown of thorns isn't uh, too bad, but these little guys, they're tough. So you take it and you wrap it around the thorns and everything. It's not going to hurt the thorns, nor you. See, so I've got it wrapped up very nice. I can pick it up. And so one of the things to do before uh, transplanting is to go ahead and uh, turn it over. I put it there so in case it falls, I don't break the crown. Look at the root system. Nice, healthy root system. This plant is a very nice, healthy, vigorous plant. So there we go. Look at that how easy it is to work with it. These guys are just super when you do something like that. Well, I want to pot them up. You need a very well-draining potting soil. I mean, that's essential. If you don't have that, these things are about to rot. So um, what you do is get yourself a pot, and not one that's too much bigger than the cactus. They can rot in that, too. It just stays too moist. So um, there's several ways of make, making a potting mix for cactus. One of them is to use a little bit of compost. Another one is to use a little bit of the vermiculite and a little bit of perlite. These are both minerals, and they're heated up and exploded, and they hold nutrients inside of them when they're in the mix. And they provide the drainage that you're looking for. So uh, those are two of the ingredients. Another couple of ingredients are basalt. Basalt is a volcanic material, and this volcanic material provides um, a type of energy also. And it's like the perlite in that it's porous, it's nice and open, it holds nutrients, it provides drainage as necessary. So um, I like to use basalt. Another one of them is to use lava sand. The lava sand is mixed in here. It's that red stuff. And uh, that has a little bit of energy of its own. So between those two things and the nutrients that actually come from compost, these guys are very nutritious. Uh, you can make a great soil. Look at this. 
So we put a little bit of it in the bottom. There we go down in the bottom and um, get that ready. And then we go in there with this guy. You don't want to bury it too deep. Uh, you don't want it to um, rot up around the crown. There it is. It's well placed. It's a little bit high in the soil. That's what you're looking for. And you just fill this around it. You water it in a little bit. And you've got yourself a great potting mix for cacti. Now, there are many mixes out there. So um, do the one that works for you. This one works for me. But uh, you can certainly find many of them already made at Garden centers and nurseries uh, or on your computer. For Backyard Basics, I'm John Dromgul. I'll see you next time. Visit klru.org slash ctg to watch online, get more tips, and to follow our blog. Until next time, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online, and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg.